Super Mario gets a lot of credit for innovations in gameplay, level design, and pretty much every other fundamental aspect of video games. And rightfully so. But the one area that is woefully underexplored when it comes to this dude is the story. Now, this is kind of understandable, especially given Miyamoto's trademark lack of exposition and the abstract way that he generally tends to portray a lot of his game worlds. Any Mario fan probably knows that genuinely fitting every single thing that we've ever seen Mario do, every level, every spin-off, every crossover appearance, etc., into a coherent and consistent picture is probably impossible. However, I do think that many aspects of the Mario lore go ignored and overlooked. Miyamoto may not be one for overall exposition dumps, but there still are connections to be made and inferences to be inferred. I'm not claiming that everything in this video should be considered totally canon or even intentional on the developer's part. I'm just going to be pointing out semi-reasonable, broad-stroke ideas about the Mario universe. It's mostly stuff that I think you can actually extract from the source material with a little bit of attention to detail and a little bit of an overactive imagination. So strap in and let's make a map of the Mario universe. If you watched my previous video, we already covered the time-bending dynamics of the Kong's family lineage. Without re-entering that same confusing wormhole all over again, we can just say that the Kongs are native to a region of the Mario planet known as Donkey Kong Country. It is a small group of islands, mostly covered in jungles, filled with wildlife. Potentially magical, but definitely delicious and nutritious bananas grow all throughout Donkey Kong Country, and serve as the Kongs and their animal friends' main food source. The main source of conflict throughout the ages in Kong life comes via contact with the Kremlings, a technologically advanced race of crocodilian pirates that have taken the seas bordering Donkey Kong Country as their home turf. The Kremlings, led by King K. Rule, make a habit of pillaging bananas from the Kongs and dumping toxic waste into their environment. Some Kongs develop strong anti-industrial sentiments as a result. In the northern section of Donkey Kong Country, which we visit in Donkey Kong Country 3 specifically, there lies the northern Kremisphere. Here, Kitty Kong and Dixie Kong meet a variety of bears, whose names all start with B. They're called the Brothers Bear, and their names stuff like Benny, Bizarre, Brash, Barter, Barnacle. There's literally like 15 bears with B names, who also happen to somewhat resemble Banjo from Banjo Kazooie. And if we pop over to Diddy Kong Racing, we also see that Banjo is pals with Diddy Kong. So I say that we can safely assume that the ILO Hags, the setting of the Banjo Kazooie games, and all of the characters we meet in those games exist over here to the north of Donkey Kong Country. Oh, and of course, Conker is here too. He was also in Diddy Kong Racing. I'm thinking more like Twelve Tales slash Pocket Tales era Conker, with Bad Fur Day taking place way further down the timeline, but we can say that Conker also exists over here. It's also worth noting that all of the Donkey Kong Country stuff is presumably way further down the timeline because of Cranky being old but let's not reopen that can of worms. To cap off this overall region, the Kremlin's sea travel and piracy ties into a wider trend of piracy and banditry present in the Mario world. There's the Tiki guys who I guess kind of exist somewhere. And there's also Lord Frederick and the polar dudes that I guess come from probably even further north, and the extremely capable Captain Sierra, a pirate hiding out on the remote kitchen island. Her activities are mostly unknown, but as fate would have it, she eventually butts heads with someone extremely important. Captain Syrup would repeatedly clash with Wario, a greedy bandit-esque character from Sarasaland. Sarasaland is a large island continent mostly covered in desert terrain. Sarasaland has humans inhabiting it, though it seems they do not exclusively reside in Sarasaland, but we'll get to that later. Despite the lack of natural abundance, the deserts of Sarasaland are filled with other types of wealth. Loads of mysterious treasures, creatures, and technologies left over from within the ruins and pyramids left behind, presumably by some 
long extinct civilization. Princess Daisy rules the kingdom and it has serious economic issues at first due to the lack of natural resources in the area. So plundering the ruins and engaging in thievery, piracy, and banditry all became commonplace in Sarasaland's deserts. Wario is a powerful but short-sighted hothead who has a questionable moral compass and an insatiable greed, and he quickly falls into a lifestyle of crime. We see a lot of this in the games that star Wario, and we can assume that throughout, he's gaining a lot of reputation and power in Sarasaland through the untold riches that he's stumbling into. He gets a castle, he encounters all sorts of mystical and mythological creatures, and eventually he butts heads with Captain Syrup, bringing us full circle. Being one of the most notorious pirates terrorizing Sarasaland, Captain Syrup's defeat by Wario's hands unintentionally calls him even more fame and favor with the people of the kingdom. Wario is now a public figure and he needs to clean his dirty money. Thus, he invests tons of money into real estate development across Sarasaland, with the first bricks being laid in what would become later Diamond City, as well as the construction of a coastal city, presumably New Donk City, further up Sarasaland's coast. The bustling new economy and wealth of new jobs in the developing New Donk City area attracts two brothers who can't seem to hang on to steady work, Mario and Luigi. Mario and Luigi have, and presumably lose, a wide variety of jobs. They work at a cement factory, Mario's a referee at a boxing ring, which, by the way, confirms that Punch-Out and all of those characters also exist here. They work on a demolition crew, they do all sorts of odd jobs, until fatefully one day they land at a construction gig. Donkey Kong, that's Donkey Kong 1, also known as Cranky Kong, just as a refresher, is young and particularly resentful of technology and industrialization due to all the previous Kremlin encounters he's had. He looks across the coast and notices an entire city skyline across the water that wasn't there prior. In a fit of blind rage and lacking judgment, Cranky crosses the water, kidnaps a woman named Pauline, and climbs to the top of the very construction site that Mario is working at. We all know the story here. Donkey Kong is sent packing by Mario making Mario a local hero for the very first time. Donkey Kong Jr. would follow his father across the water, freeing him and escaping with him back to Donkey Kong Country, but not before an accidental scuffle with an exterminator, Stanley the Bugman. Wario is immediately threatened and jealous when Mario is hailed as Sarasaland's new hero, and the attention is pulled away from himself. So, in a multi-part scheme to defame Mario, Wario decides to take things intergalactic. Somehow, perhaps via contact with an extraterrestrial being, or by means of an alien artifact or technology plundered from the deserts of Sarasaland, Wario contacts various forms of alien life and employs their help in a variety of ways. The first I'll cover, and potentially the most devious, is his contact with Bomberman, portrayed clearly in Wario Blast. Wario has always had an association with bombs, with many Wario-themed levels in Mario spin-offs taking on the appearance of literal bomb factories. So it makes perfect sense. Wario strong-arms Bomberman, who is an alien from Planet Bomber, into supplying him with bombs, and perhaps other forms of tech and weaponry that he can sell to the highest bidder back on the Mario planet. Presumably, at some point, Wario begins supplying the Koopa army with bombs, bullets, clown cars, and airships, making the filthiness of his wealth grow to an even further degree. But we'll get into the Koopas soon. To elaborate on Bomberman, his presence as a reluctant intergalactic arms dealer could be used to prove a bunch of other connections that are slightly more flimsy, admittedly. Many characters, like Solid Snake, for example, have bombers themed after them in the newer Bomberman games. Snake specifically also has Mario and Yoshi figurines in the GameCube versions of the Metal Gear Solid games on his side, but frankly, I wouldn't really consider any of this stuff canon. If so, a ridiculous amount of IP would be canon to the Mario universe pretty much instant. Castlevania, Ganbare Goemon, Ratchet and Clank, Halo, Portal, and by extension Half-Life, I guess? This is just ridiculous, but depending on how much leniency you're willing to lend, perhaps all this stuff does exist in the Mario universe, just light years away. Who knows? Anyway, this contact with Bomberman is merely the first in Wario's intergalactic exploits, but we'll cover the other ones as they come up in the timeline.
All this being involved with space alien stuff leaves Wario richer and more powerful, and is probably how he's able to fund such extensive real estate and technological development in the first place. So Mario's starting to make a name for himself, Wario's feeling threatened, but Mario's unwittingly about to escalate things by a large margin. News reports come in about turtle-like creatures roaming around beneath New Donk City. Mario, newly viewed as the local hero of sorts, takes his brother Luigi into the sewers and does battle with a variety of strange creatures. This is depicted in the Mario Bros. arcade game. Now, determined to find the source of the creatures, the brothers plunge through the pipes and across the sea to the Mushroom Kingdom. We first have to rewind and explain the Mushroom Kingdom in its entirety. It's a kingdom of natural abundance, and where I would probably guess that humans originate from, with their presence in Sarasaland being a somewhat recent development, in pursuit of the continent's buried treasure perhaps? I don't know. But the Mushroom Kingdom itself is abundant with grasslands and tons of mushrooms and flowers growing across the continent. The red mushrooms contain magical power that enlarge a person and increases their strength. The green mushrooms literally resurrect someone from the dead one time. Other mushrooms and flowers Flowers have a variety of effects with a strong focus on inheriting the abilities of other creatures and potentially disguising the user as that creature as well. There's also a race of mushroom people on the continent, the toads, that live off the land in harmony with humans throughout the eight worlds of the Mushroom Kingdom. The Seven Kings and Princess Peach rule over the eight worlds, and the society on the Mushroom Kingdom is a relatively simple self-sustaining one. But below this peace-loving land rests an imminent threat lying in wait the Koopa Kingdom. This barren volcanic region on the outskirts of the Mushroom Kingdom is natively home to the turtle-like Koopas and other cold-blooded forms of life that are able to survive the harsh climate. Life in the Koopa Kingdom is rough. The eldest among the Koopas, out of desperation, begin to dabble in dark magic of some kind. It's extremely interesting to note how closely these powers we generally see the Magic Koopas utilize mirror the powers of the mushrooms and power-ups of the Mushroom Kingdom. Magic Koopas can increase one in size and make them super powered, eerily similar to a red mushroom. They can also resurrect you from the dead much like a one-up mushroom, albeit as a rotting skeletal horror. The parallels continue, but I digress. My theory is that Bowser is merely himself a creation of the Magic Koopas, serving as a hand-raised puppet figurehead and symbol of strength for the Magic Koopas to better command the Koopas as a militaristic force. The Magic Koopas raise Bowser, telling him tales of his destiny to conquer the Mushroom Kingdom and take Princess Peach as his rightful queen. As Bowser ages, he builds his army, expanding from merely the Koopas to all the nearby species of the Mushroom Kingdom. And the Magic Koopas always create a super-powered puppet figurehead to lead them and act as an intermediary. This explains most of the boss characters we see in Mario games. They're almost always just a normal enemy type, but bigger and in a position of royalty. Bowser is then supplied with bombs and bullets by Wario, as we discussed before. With a full army and now fully armed, Bowser launches his first all-out attack on the Mushroom Kingdom proper while the Seven Kings are away on business in Sarasaland or something. I don't really know why they're not here. Bowser kidnaps Princess Peach and takes her back to his castle, turning the entire Mushroom Kingdom into blocks using unclear means. Probably some of that magic Koopa dark magic, I would assume. And that's literally canonically why Super Mario Bros. 1 looks like this, by the way, with everything being blocks. But yeah, a cool theory I actually have is that all the blocks you ever see in the subsequent Mario games are merely remnants of the events of the first Super Mario Bros. Bowser literally turned every inch of the kingdom into blocks, so naturally it takes years and years for every single block to be cleared back away. I don't know, just a thought. Clever lore explanations for graphical limitations aside, this brings us full circle. Some of Bowser's minions leak through the warp pipes beneath the Mushroom Kingdom, setting up the events of before when Mario and Luigi are attracted to the warp pipes beneath Sarasaland, and the rest is history. Mario and Luigi make their way through the Mushroom Kingdom, meet the Toads, and ultimately defeat Bowser and save Peach from his clutches. This establishes Mario as a worldwide hero rather than just a local one and sparks his potential romantic relationship with the princess. Bowser retreats to the Koopa Kingdom to regroup. Wario boils over in a jealous rage at Mario's newfound superstardom, and things are about to get even crazier. But for now, Mario celebrates, and he, Luigi, Peach, and the Toads become fast friends. Our next section is a little bit of a detour, but it's necessary. Strap in.
Now, Super Mario Bros. 2 is not originally a Mario game, and for a long time I would have been one to argue that therefore it shouldn't count towards the canon. But at this point, so many elements have been folded into the Mario lore from this game that we kind of have to consider it canon. But my take on it is still a little bit different. I interpret the game as sort of a dark allegory. The group of friends that we just discussed are collectively sharing horrific flashbacks to the trauma drama and horror of the violent conflict with the Koopa army, with Wart and his ilk being Bowser and Koopa stand-ins manifested psychologically through their shared dreams. It's a powerful metaphor for post-traumatic stress and the horrors of war. You could also just interpret it as Subcon being a place that does literally exist, but is merely accessed via dreaming. In this interpretation, the version of Link from the Game Boy games, like Link's Awakening and such, would also presumably exist in the Mario universe. I won't explain why, as it's kind of a spoiler, but I suppose if one version of Link exists in universe here, it's pretty safe to assume that all of the Legend of Zelda games exist in universe. The one shred of proof being this shared connection to the Dream Realm subcon. Mario 2 isn't really that important beyond that. Of course, it gave us gems like Birdo and a lot of other cool characters, but nothing really beyond the surface. And besides, Wario is cooking up a plan to steal Mario's thunder, so let's move on. So quite literally, the events of Super Mario Land and Super Mario Land 2 are as follows. Wario calls an alien named Tatanga to the Mario planet to kidnap Daisy, purposely luring Mario away from his new hangout in the Mushroom Kingdom. Wario steals Mario's castle, which I guess he has now, using it as an opportunity to challenge Mario outside of the direct view of Sarasaland's citizens. Mario of course prevails, and Wario is sent packing. Wario also tries at least one more attack directly against Mario during the events of Mario and Wario, but the lore of that one is bare bones even for me, and Wario mostly seems to settle down after this, operating in the background, enjoying his hoard of blood money, and eventually becoming the game developer, leaving Mario alone entirely. Tatanga publicly attacking the Mario planet, however, presumably alerts the entire population of the planet to the existence of the interstellar, turning their eyes towards the stars, possibly leading to even further embrace of technology. This would eventually even include cars, which I assume Wario might also be involved in the manufacture of, maybe with his signature bike being a part of a marketing image for his brand of motor-powered vehicles. This explains, of course, Mario Kart and all of that, though I assume this is way later down the timeline due to the now-friendly nature of the villainous characters. Also, cars bring us on a weird tangent, allowing me to clean house a little bit here. A poster in Stunt Race FX featuring not only Mario, but also Fox McCloud and Kirby also confirms their existence in space somewhere out there in the Mario universe. Including both of these franchises is a vast inclusion on its own, but it also opens up more connected questions. Kirby at one point meets Samus, and come to think of it, Samus also appears as a cameo in Super Mario RPG, so... Okay, Metroid is canon too, but let's get extreme. Kirby also had an outing with the Poyos from Poyo Poyo in Kirby's Avalanche. So is the entire Poyo Poyo franchise and the larger Madu Monogatari franchise that it belongs to also canon? I don't know, maybe. And if that's the case, I guess Sonic is here too, thanks to the best game in his franchise, Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine. I don't know, but it's worth considering at least. To bring things back down to whatever this planet is called, we know from Odyssey and Galaxy later on that the Mushroom Kingdom's residents do eventually make it spacebound. We know the moon of the planet, which I forgot to put on the map, is home to a group of rabbits called the Brutals. And the rabbit moon connection is interesting to say the least if Sarasaland is the source of alien contact, because the region is also home to a rabbit costume power up. Rabbits also have a mysterious vibe to them in Mario 64, so something strange is definitely afoot here. When Mario goes interstellar himself, we learn about the Lumas and Rosalina and all of that in Galaxy. I'm gonna be honest and just say I'm writing them off as star aliens that are meant to be the star-themed civilization of the planet, with the Mushroom Kingdom being obviously themed after mushrooms, Sarasaland after coins I guess, Donkey Kong Country after bananas, the Flower Kingdom, which I also forgot because Mario Wonder didn't even exist when I first started this video, is obviously themed after flowers, etc. There's also the Bean Bean Kingdom, which I guess is themed after... beans? 
but I don't know what's up with that place. And the Sprixies are also just some random fairies that I guess I'll mention now, who exist somewhere distant through a series of transparent warp pipes. That's all the alien stuff covered, I think. But there's also another source of potential technology we have to discuss. But first, let's decompress and pivot for just one moment. The most vital piece of Super Mario lore is, of course, myself. Bullet William. Some say I am a bad guy, but I would describe myself simply as a straight shooter. While I have you here, we should probably mention that despicable and deplorable character known as Waluigi. He is brother of Wario. We do not speak of him often and it is better if you do the same. In this instance, silence is indeed golden. <laughs> So aliens are probably to blame for all of this gosh darn technology the kids are using these days. But we also have to investigate Professor E. Gad, who through his role in helping Luigi to ward off King Boo in the Luigi's Mansion games, we know is also capable of inventing incredibly advanced technology. E. Gad is an alien. Or maybe he's just a brilliant scientist that is able to interface with and learn from the alien tech. But either way, EGAD is definitely to blame for some of the gadgets around here. And despite the professor's good intentions, his inventions often fall into the wrong hands. I like to think for some reason that EGAD invented the quote unquote magical paint slash ink that is utilized by Bowser in Mario 64. The ink acts as portals, which, wait a minute, ink that acts as portals when applied to certain surfaces? And the moon also holds some sort of magical significance? I guess Portal really is canon after all. But anyway, Bowser uses the ink portals to paint over the paintings of Peach's castle in Super Mario 64, making them lead straight to various regions that are under his immediate control. Another villain that utilizes tech that has to come into question here is King K. Rool, also a scientist by the way, as well as Donkey Kong with these robotic Marios? This is totally bizarre, but seriously, no more pondering about Kong time travel and its implications. Let's just say that this is cranky in his younger years, and he just scuffled with Mario more times than we initially thought. Although, this wouldn't align with when the alien tech would have been discovered, and... Okay, no, no. Let's backtrack to Bowser, because his son, Bowser Jr., is the one who utilizes the paint ink stuff in Super Mario Sunshine. And this dude is gonna help us finish out our main story arc. So Bowser Jr. He also uses the ink stuff to terrorize Isle Delfina, an island destination near the Mushroom Kingdom. But who is he? He's definitely Bowser's son, which is more than I can say about the Koopalings, along with the other lesser-known Koopa leaders such as Boom Boom and Pom Pom. The Koopalings were originally perceived as Bowser's children, but nowadays they're just kind of referred to as his henchmen. I like to think maybe after their failure in Mario Bros. 3, they were stripped of their familial titles as punishment, but that's just headcanon. Bowser either reproduces asexually like Godzilla, which also begs a general comparison between the Mario trope of gigantified creatures and the general idea of kaiju, Bowser and DK would be the OGs, just like Godzilla and King Kong, or Lizzie and George. Bowser was created by the Magic Koopa Magic, and thus his children naturally would be superpowered Koopas as well. Or, maybe all of the Koopalings and such were also just created by the Magic Koopas directly, and it's all just a misunderstanding. Bowser Jr. Though, he's explicitly referred to as Bowser's son. He's easy to confuse with Baby Bowser from the end of Yoshi's Island. And let's just talk about Yoshi's Island, I guess. It's an island with Yoshis. Yoshis are friendly dinosaurs who are into fruit. A lot like the Kongs, but with a slightly more diverse palette. The Yoshis fight Baby Bowser, meaning Bowser during his literal age of infancy, who was presumably sent back here in a strange convoluted attempt to assassinate the Mario cast of characters as about to be born babies by literally stealing them from the stork? I, I don't know. 
The Yoshis befriend all the Mario characters before they're even technically born, I guess, and they kick baby Bowser out of there. Mario later returns to Yoshi's Island, which is part of the larger Dinosaur Land region, in Super Mario World, where his prior relationship to the Yoshis becomes the ace up his sleeve. Yoshis also seem to continuously do battle with Magic Koopas over the years, so it seems like the Koopa masterminds are really interested in Yoshi's Island specifically for some reason, but the point is, Bowser Jr. is not baby Bowser from Yoshi's Island. He's Bowser's son, and helps him in many of Bowser's repeated and ever-escalating schemes against Mario. But when Bowser Jr. finally steps up as a main antagonist in Super Mario Sunshine, we get moral closure and a proper end to the Mushroom Koopa conflict. I view this game as the last one in the timeline of the conflict between Mario and Bowser. Bowser Jr., pumped up as usual by his false belief that Peach is his mother, uses the EGAD ink to frame Mario for vandalizing Isle Delfino. EGAD, seeing his tech be misused for a second time, has now invented Flood and helps Mario in combating it. Mario is so deep into his hero being career at this point that he's actually trying to take a vacation at this point. But anyway, Bowser, after so many failed schemes against Mario over the years, has started to kind of realize that he's just somewhat of a pawn to the Magic Koopas, and he's questioning the point of his struggle against Mario and the Mushroom Kingdom entirely. Seeing his son heartbroken and fueled by false promises from the Magic Koopas really strains Bowser's ability to maintain his villainous persona. And then, when Bowser Jr. is defeated by Mario directly in Super Mario Sunshine, Bowser breaks down in a redemptive of closing arc for his character, telling Bowser Jr. the truth, that Peach is not his mother, and that living in constant conflict is not worth it. Bowser's not so bad after all. I guess this explains all the partying him and Mario are able to do later on? That pretty much concludes the broad strokes of our known Mario plotline without getting into the nitty gritty of every single one of his adventures individually. However, the map remains blurry, so we have a few loose ends to tie up. You know Balloon Fight? I was always ready to say that it takes place in Mario's planet strictly based off of the art style, the prevalence of warp pipes, and balloons also being a power up in Mario. The big fish also seems a lot like a cheap cheap to me, perhaps one that the Magic Koopas got a hold of. Beyond this, Balloon Fight also crosses directly over with Zelda. Zelda, with Tingle appearing in some of his own Balloon Fight spin-off games. And we already established that Zelda exists in this universe previously, so Balloon Fight is in. And similarly, Lolo and Lala from the Adventures of Lolo appear in Kirby, further tying in the legendary Starfy series as well. The connections start to get really blurry out here on the fringes, and if we get too deep into the crossovers and stuff, like imagine if we included all of Super Smash Bros, it just gets insane. Now, you could make a pretty good argument for Mr. Game & Watch, actually, between the Mario Game & Watch games and the Game & Watch Gallery Mario reskins of old Game & Watch games, and you get the point. If we really go crazy here, we can cram in practically like half of the gaming industry in some secondhand manner, but that's not the point. The point is, the map is complete. Yeah! And beyond a lot of the stupid stuff on the fringes, we were able to actually glean many insights about the rich world of Mario that Miyamoto and the rest of the developers have crafted over the years. I'm sure there's tons of stuff I missed, but that's inevitable with source material this vast, and of course it's all open to interpretation, which is part of what makes it great for those of us with a little bit of an imagination. Please comment your own theories, corrections, speculation below. I welcome it. And thanks for all your support on the Kong Family Tree video, by the way. I sincerely mean it when I say that this video you just watched pretty much only exists because of people insisting that they wanted to see it. So I appreciate it a ton, and I hope it was worth the wait. And I'm not sure what else to say, but... It is me, Bullet William, again with another important news to be telling you. You can subscribe to this channel Backseat Sakurai for more stupid videos about cool video games and stuff, even development updates on the Pikmin Tower Defense fan game. Please comment with all of your theories, especially about me, Bullet William, specifically. Also like the video, subscribe, share it, add it to your top 8, dig it, etc 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 and I will catch you later.